Just a few days after uh, the American president-elect Donald Trump takes power in America, China's Xi Jinping is all set to inaugurate the Chance port in Peru, marking a major inroad in South America. There are 21 Latin American countries that have joined China's BRI project already, and this latest development is expected to further help China become a major trading partner of South American countries. China has been secretly building relationships with South American nations and hopes to revive its Silk Road in the Latin American countries with the help of Brazil and Peru. This major port will be unveiled as the world continues to be focused on the wars in Ukraine and the Middle East. So what are the implications of Chinese megaport entry to South America and how big a boost will it be to the Belt and Road Initiative that India has steered clear of due to Chinese debt trap tactics? Let's start our conversation. Ambassador Suresh Koyal, it's interesting to note that China continues to be expanding its military bases, its ports. In, in, in Africa alone, there are some 93 ports that China uh, operates, uh, it has set up. In the Indian Ocean region, there are at, at least 20 of these ports that have been built and now operated by China. There are a number of ports, number of military bases that China is in the process of setting up by way of the Belt and Road Initiative in countries including Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan and other neighbors. When you take a look at South America now, now there have been a large number of the Latin American nations, including Cuba and Venezuela, who have joined forces with China to allow for the Belt and Road Initiative to enter into their territories as well. And now on top of it, there is a new port, perhaps the first port which is going to be opened in South America by China. What are going to be the implications of it? Mega, good evening. Uh, you have given a beautiful and very detailed description of what China's global aspirations are in terms of expansion of its military path through ports, BRI, etc., etc. And therefore, I don't think I need to add any further. Uh, I'm only thinking, uh, basically, uh, uh, as we get the report uh, from the satellite images and the published sources about China building a nuclear powered aircraft carrier as we, we begin to think about expanding Chinese naval power. But the information and the news about China's attempt to develop its naval power are not new. They have been there for a long time. If you recall, we have very, very often raised uh, flags about the presence of Chinese submarines and the Chinese deep, the deep sea uh, trawlers, etc., etc., in Indian Ocean. Uh, our basic objection to BRI has been because that the dual use ports facilities being constructed by China in these countries are clearly an attempt to expand their nuclear power. Djibouti port, Sri Lanka, Hamban Tota, Bangladesh, those are all there. We know that. Now, China is building assets in terms of the floating, uh, floating floaters, in terms of both ships, submarines, and everything. They already have the nuclear power submarines uh, to further progress as a nuclear power. Uh, now, I think we need to go beyond this. Really, we have to. We should know that China is going to further expand. China is going to further develop, spend money on developing the nuclear resources. Uh, the point really here is, what can be the response to this? And I think, in terms of response, we have to limit. Chinese expand, we can't stop the Chinese expansion. China will grow. But we have to limit the Chinese options in case they begin to exercise these resources to expand their presence, expand their influence. And I think from that point of view, uh, uh, we have to think, and I've been very, very uh, uh, outright in this thing. Uh, we have so far exercised the strategic autonomy to keep our options open. Situation is now coming when the world is rapidly congregating into different new, different military alliances. Whether it is Europe, Japan has given the call for developing an Asia and Asian NATO. We know that in Indo-Pacific, in the Indian Ocean. China is expanding. We know that now. 
uh, it's a different thing that Trump's approach to China could be different, and he might further want to limit the Chinese influence. But I think we need to seriously consider as to how we provide a response in terms of restricting Chinese attempt to grow this influence to work in the immediate areas of our concern, and that is Indian Ocean. We have excellent options in this case. We have exercised one in terms of developing our integrated command in Andaman. We are, we have developed, or we have a nuclear uh, uh, power submarine. I think we need to really develop counter response to this Chinese presence. And this is important because uh, India is an aspiring uh, power. It's aspiring to be a global power. And that aspiration can only be fulfilled if we can play our role in meeting with the Chinese aspirations in this area. If not completely countering them, not completely responding to them, but to at least let them have the message that if you try to use these resources against Indian interests, we are ready. Okay. 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 okay, Professor Nandan Alipat, this is also, as uh, uh, Ambassador Goel was mentioning, there has been a parallel development and as per the research and satellite images that have come to fore, uh, China has built nuclear reactor prototypes that are then going to power its aircraft carriers. Now, this is happening in the vicinity of India, in the Indo-Pacific Indo region. We already know that the Chinese fleet... Uh, the Chinese Navy numerically is the largest in the world. It is very f uh, aggressively competing with America to, be to become the most powerful, uh, most dominating naval fleet across the globe. In a situation such as this, and in addition to these ports that are being set up, these military bases that are being built, there are, I think, about more than a thousand of them when we take a look at the add them up in africa and the indian subcontinent in the larger uh, you know indian ocean region and then now uh, movement happening towards south america as well latin america as well uh, is it then going to be, be a, a massive challenge for the world including america and india to fight this aggressive nature by which china wants to control the world uh, Mega, you raised a very significant point. And Ambassador Goel correctly said the world is being split into two camps. Now, when that happens, you have to basically ensure that you're in one camp or the other firmly. If you remember, we had a policy of quote unquote non alignment. It is like basically uh, sitting on two fences, and when the fences move apart, you fall down in between. So you're neither here nor there. I think that is very dangerous. And as far as India's choice is concerned, China has made that choice for us. It is out to get territory at our expense. It's out to basically dominate the, the Eurasian continent. It's out to dominate the Indo-Pacific. So I think China has made up uh, the, what should be what the decision taken by us. We have to... Well, one of the big plus now today, for example, when you look at some of the names of those who are joining the administration of President Trump, they are what you call, I mean, China hawks. I would say they're China realists. I, I don't know about this hawk or dove business, but either you're realistic or you're living in a world of illusions. But the fact of the matter is that they are very clear about the threat posed by China. And today, what Newsex has, has, has talked about indicates the depth of that threat. You know, a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier can go around the world. And frankly, it can go around the world several times without ever needing to refuel, ever needing to visit a port uh, facility. And that's a very serious situation. The same goes for a nuclear-powered submarine. It can go on to depths which are pretty large, significant. And the, as a consequence, it's very important for us to ramp up our game. And two things. 
The people who are around President Trump, I have the privilege of, of uh, having some contact with some of them. They are very pro-India because they believe that uh, China is anti-India, which is true. And they believe that they can count on India uh, to basically do what we need to do anyway, which is confront China and try and prevent Chinese expansionism in the theaters in which we are active. So I think this time for sitting on two fences is over. Right. It's not good to work. I think we have to clearly understand that in this Cold War 2.0, we have to take a side. And may I remind you, Mega, once again, something I made many times before. In Cold War 1.0, China took a side against the Soviet Union and benefited immensely from that. In Cold War 2.0, our benefit to the United States and to many other countries is essentially as a country that is with them in countering China. And okay. we have to basically step up to that and show that we are reliable, show that we, have, we are not ambivalent, we do not equivocate. I think that's a very important point made by you and frankly, uh, what the ambassador who talked about two worlds. You can either be in one world or the other. You can't be in both, Mega. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Vijay Kranti, let's hear it from you. And talking about the specifics and, and, and the practicalities of setting up ports and military bases, uh, why is it challenging for India and, and, uh, and a more convenient activity for China to take up in building ports across the globe? Now, we have been able to do so successfully in the subcontinent particularly, but we have still not been able to reach uh, you know, major, major countries in Africa or you talk about uh, uh, in Egypt, you talk about now Latin America as well. Why, why are we, what are we falling short of? You know, there is no doubt that uh, India currently is not in a position to match what China has achieved, especially its uh, naval presence. And I think India has uh, uh, its own very set agenda. And uh, even if India has started very, very late, but still India now understands where it is going. And there is uh, no doubt there is a gap between India and China. And the gap is quite massive because China is trying to uh, match America. And uh, we are not in that race. But in today's world, it is not necessary that uh, uh, every country should be should have everything. We need to have, as our my previous friends, uh, uh, Ambassador Goel and Professor Nalapa, have already pointed out that now it is time to to join hands uh, with like-minded powers, countries, and uh, as the things are developing, and al already Professor Nalapa also explained that our choices are becoming quite clear now and we now understand uh, which side if we have to join where would we be but as far as uh, never uh, this issue of uh, the, the the recent uh, this nuclear power um, uh, aircraft carrier is concerned i have gone through the uh, news quite in details and one thing is basic that number one china has not yet developed a nuclear power aircraft carrier. The news is purely a speculation. It is summing up many, many factors, uh, developments within Chinese uh, level uh, uh, system. And it, some, some institution has put up all those information to, and then try to create the elephant that uh, China is moving towards a nuclear powered uh, aircraft carrier. Uh, one thing I would say that uh, even if China develops one, it cannot match America in a very in the long future because America has 11 nuclear powered uh, aircraft carriers and this will be first if China develops it really. And moreover, uh, China has already only three uh, aircraft carriers, the normal ones, uh, and out of those three, two are the old type and one 
which it has developed on its own is quite modern. There is no doubt about it. Okay. Now the question comes how relevant it is to India. Number one, India, of course it is a serious uh, issue and India should take note of it. But it's not such a threat that India should get jittery or we should start, start worrying uh, out of proportion. Uh, after all, for China, uh, India, India's uh, or uh, the, uh, the, the China's naval interest about India are through Indian Ocean and the surrounding portions. So these places are not China's home place, like South China Sea. Uh, everything said and done. Whether no, but still there are there are Chinese bases and ports that have been bought and built by by China in the no, Indian Ocean region, and that is an uh, alarm. India has been trying to mirror it, but but to to only limited success. Yeah, there are more than ninety uh, ports which are available to China uh, in different degrees. Uh, some are real bases of China, and there are many where it is. Uh, uh, it has uh, the, the facilities of the host country, there is no doubt about it. But what I was saying was that a nuclear uh, aircraft carrier, nuclear power aircraft carrier of China uh, should not be a big threat. Okay. What all said and done, it is a sitting duck. You okay. Know, when you talk to the different okay. experts, a, 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 any um, warship is today a sitting duck. Today the, the facilities or the, uh, the, the scope of uh, air power, the missile power and intercontinental missiles, that is so wide and India is quite an advanced country in that. Okay, that okay, all right. So, Fair enough. You've made your point, sir. Captain uh, Sham Kumar also on the telecast with me. Captain Sham Kumar, uh, you know, understanding the technicalities of uh, nuclear powered submarines and nuclear powered uh, uh, aircraft carriers, and my previous panelists have spoken about them at length. But uh, how does it make uh, one country's navy more capable and stronger than the others when it is nuclear powered? Uh, thank you, Meha, Mega. Uh, this uh, aircraft carriers are basically designed for uh, distant uh, shore operations. And they are actually a country's mind for sea power. Actually, aircraft carriers are the, the country's prestige for expeditionary designs. The countries like America has the presence global felt because the aircraft carrier, 11 of them, nuclear powered with very high period of endurance at sea without support, except the limitation of the crew change, which you see. So that is how the aircraft carriers are planned. And in case we are looking at expeditionary designs or uh, you know, far-flung uh, power projection, which is done by aircraft carrier, because when aircraft carrier moves forward, it has the aircraft air cover, which is extended further for its support ships. So the support ships, destroyers and cruisers can carry out distant operations under the cover which is not possible from the shore so whether it is pacific scenario indian ocean scenario or atlantic scenario mediterranean scenario these are the places where aircraft carriers are normally placed by america because they can operate independently for very long time cruisers with nuclear power have been a distant of a, a, a gone for one uh, the conclusion now because only americans had it so when we are looking at china developing a reactor for a aircraft carrier which is port, it is unlikely that it will be fitted in the port. But since China has expeditionary design, the political will of China is very clear to expand the naval power. They are the strongest, not the strongest, but in ship's number, they are the number one in the Navy today, more than even uh, America. Quality-wise, they are not. And as far as the aircraft carrier is concerned, obviously they want to match the naval capabilities of China, that is to become class one Navy, which is only France and America today. Only France and America operates nuclear powered aircraft carriers. So they want to become that. And uh, the president of China has been very categorically saying about this expansion plan. So if this news is going on, it is not out of the context because the carrier, the fourth carrier which they are designing, which has already been uh, spoken by the, uh, the the political commissioner of uh, commissioner of the uh, PLA Navy. So I feel 
the fourth one will not be nuclear power because okay. china is very cautiously operating their incremental designs slowly progressing on the coastal level in the south china sea they are operating within the shore cover and slowly they are operating power because they have no further experience of their craft okay. operations okay and, all right but, but then should we be rest you know should we rest assured ambassador goel that because china at this point of time is not as capable and not as powerful in terms of its naval might as compared to us and as compared to france it will not be able to cover the distance and then Com be completely con be competitive. Com competitive. Remember, as as I, as was mentioned by Captain Sham Kumar previously as well, that you know it is numerically the largest fleet across the globe. How much more time will it take for it to become the most powerful fleet across the globe? And 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 also uh, the question about uh, how significant it is for India to make itself uh, uh, capable or. Uh, uh, so that it is able to fight the chinese naval threat in the india in, in the indo pacific in the indian ocean region should we at this point of time sit back and relax and say that uh, while we have capability to fight the chinese in the navy, in, in in the seas uh, and it does not matter if we are if we are lagging behind china or or we we at this point of time are are, are satisfied with the fact that us continues to still be uh, the biggest uh, uh, powerful most powerful naval force in the world and and in the hopes that it is going to be america that will be supporting and helping out india in the indian ocean indo pacific region you are getting into what the whole government is occupied with i'm sure because the security uh, perception the security policies uh, which any country has be will depend upon their own threat perception they will depend upon what their uh, uh, security parameters are how far do they want to go it depends upon the kind of resources which are available there is a whole lot of details on these things which obviously we can't discuss on a, on a panel like this but what i would say really here is uh, i don't think that india has ever given a call that they want to become Uh, a global military power uh, really in that sense we do not have the capacity our economy is still growing unless we are able to reach the economic level of the usa or china i think we need to be realistic in our approach uh, <coughs> therefore <coughs> i would say that our approach is guided by <coughs> how to secure our interests globally and the region regionally uh, <coughs> and the global interests are limited to our economic requirements influence that we are able to meet the influence globally uh I'll let me give you an example uh, our interactions with say country like brazil or argentina i'm mentioning those because they are in latin america and the other farthest from india would really be growing trade and investment ties economic ties developing cultural ties uh, i don't think that we would ever imagine that our submarines will be able to protect the shores of argentina or uh, or peru in case there is a threat of usa is there as a security provider in the area but if chinese influence in let us say argentina limits their options to conduct trade or economic work to china india then we get concerned because from argentina we do get certain necessary inputs into our own economic growth including minerals and therefore that is what we need to guard that in growing chinese influence does not limit our options from that point of view the message to china has to be that you are there but you should not look at india as a target either economic target or military target or anything Okay. I think this is what our approach should be, and from that point of view, developing our presence, strength in the surrounding areas in our neighbourhood is quite adequate, really, for the time being. I would say. Okay, uh, Professor Madhu Nalapat, how uh, <coughs> integral it is for India uh, to have uh, uh, its strength, uh, which is going to be comparable to China or United States of America. uh and uh, can there be a purposeful effort uh, be put in uh, going to other countries and building our ports and building our military 
basis and how uh, fast should this progress be? Uh, Mega, we have signed an agreement with the United States in which they can use our basis, we can use their basis, and they have got bases across the world. So that, that's an important point. But I'd like to say that this shows the importance of tech and the importance of decoupling from tech. And I think uh, we need to understand that and we should sharply reduce the share of China uh, in, 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 in especially in matters relating to tech. And that includes the mobile phone. You've seen how risky the mobile phone is in Lebanon when the Israelis made use of that to create havoc uh, within Hezbollah cadres. The fact of the matter is that anything connected with technology, we have to de-link from hostile countries. And by its action, China has shown it's hostile. So that is a very important point. Yes, I certainly hope one day China will know it is better to be friendly with India and not. But they haven't woken up to a realization for a long time. And I suspect they won't for a long time. What the Chinese are doing is trying to create an illusion or a reality of deterrence mm. so that they can deter other powers when they take kinetic action against uh, a third power, such as Taiwan, for example, such as the Philippines, for example, uh, such as uh, uh, locations such as the South China Sea or the East China Sea. And they want to create deterrence. So other countries will be very nervous to directly get involved with, with China. Okay. That is their game. And the only way to fight it is by ensuring that we have a deterrent together with our friends strong enough to meet that challenge. I, I stress this word, Vega, together with our friends. It's no accident Elon Musk went to Donald Trump. Elon Musk understands he's got a deliverage from China and he's doing so. And he's looking increasingly at India. Mm -hmm. US defense companies will need to look increasingly at India to source production. And for all that, I think a very clear signal has to be sent that we are determined and, and we have people. We have wonderful manpower. Yeah. In the army, for example, nobody has the quality that India has got. Our airmen, our, 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 say our naval uh, officers and, and, and men, they're among the, the finest, if not the finest in the world. And there are literally millions of young people who can be trained in that. So okay. India is then Indian talent. I mean, so much of, of US tech is driven by ethnic Indian talent. Uh, some estimates put it at 60%. Maybe it's only 40%. That's a huge number. So we have immense potentialities. And okay. that is why so many people in the incoming administration are looking in a very friendly way at India. And they need to know that India is a reliable partner, that India is going to look after its own interests. Yes. And we can't do that without looking after the interests of our friends and partners as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Vichikranti, again, the question about the Belt and Road Initiative. And do, you, do you find it to be alarming that there are so many countries in Latin America that have aligned their interests with China's Belt and Road Initiative? Uh, there are a number of countries now in the Indian subcontinent, in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, barring Europe uh, and North America, there is not a continent that China has not touched upon and allowed for investments to pour in for its Belt and Road Initiative. How uh, wary should the world in India particularly be? You know, I would say that uh, uh, on one hand, one can say that China has expanded uh, its, uh, you know, uh, BRI uh, all across the world. But the very practical side of it is that China has spread itself too thin across the world and over in, in, in past since uh, 2013 when uh, this BRI started, uh, BRI has exposed itself as a wrong option and you will see there is a you know now there is a, a chain of countries who have started opting out of it and there are many countries which already have invested Chinese money and are not in a position to return the money, the net result is that China's massive money is blocked and locked in uh, these countries 
and a majority of those countries are not in a position to pay back nor those projects which china has started uh, under bri with these countries they are proving not to be productive for those countries so even if china is now going to latin america or uh, other countries i don't think it's a very wise move on the part of xi jinping uh, he has already seen that bri uh, has outlived its utility and appeal so i don't see that uh, china okay. expansion to in the uh-huh. is going to make a very big difference for a positive thing. i don't i okay. don't see that Okay, all right. Uh, okay, I, uh, on that note, I'm completely out of time. I thank all of you for joining me on the telecast and sharing your views. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon.